Okay, let's uh, let's get started. Welcome back. Uh, let's talk a little bit about the assignments, and then we'll jump back to lecture material. Hopefully, all of you got assignment nine submitted okay last night. And we now enter the last mile, assignment 10. So this will be the 10th and the final assignment. So let's talk a little bit about assignment 10 for a moment. So we've talked about this a few times already. So uh, again, leave, your leave yourself a fair bit of time for assignment 10 because this is going to be doing a little bit of system integration. You're going to be polishing off your Python code that you developed in assignments 1, 2, and 3 and you're now going to integrate it with your robot simulator. Uh, as a good summary of what you're going to be completing in this uh, assignment, your hill climber is now going to be taking your set, your matrix of 4 by 8 or 32 synaptic weights, exporting it to your robot simulator, which is going to read in those 32 weights, use it to label the neural network. You're going to run your simulator for a thousand time steps. The simulator will then end and it will send back uh, a single number to your Python code, which is the fitness of the robot using the neural network with those 32 synaptic weights. Your hill climber reads in that fitness, which is assigned to the parent matrix. The parent matrix is then copied, and when it's copied, you introduce a few mutations. That set of slightly modified 32 weights are sent to the simulator and around and around and around you go, right? Okay, um, you're going to be, the two pieces of code are going to, going to be communicating with files, which is not the most efficient way to do things. I saw that someone put up a post on the subreddit the other day about using pipes to communicate between Python and C. If you're familiar with pipes or you want to try that, that's also fine. Doesn't matter to me how you get your Python code to communicate with your C code as long as they do. One is sending 32 numbers to the other and the other one is, is returning it. Okay, so what you're going to be submitting for assignment 10 is just a single screenshot and what we want to see in this single screenshot is evidence that you've successfully integrated your hill climber with your robot simulator. So just uh, to remind ourselves of how this works, you're going to have numbers being written out here, which are the results from your hill climber. And if you look carefully, you'll see that in the left-hand column here, this is the generation of your generations of your hill climber. The second column here is the fitness of the parent, and the parent is always the one that has the highest fitness. Unless, for example, at generation 26 here, a parent set of synaptic weights that had a fitness of 0.88 produced a child that managed to get the robot to move much further than the parent did. So the child replaces the parent and becomes the parent and continues on until it produces a child that has higher fitness than itself, right? So the TA or myself can eyeball the numbers on the right here to see whether your uh, hill climber is working correctly. And what is the hill climber selecting for? The fitness now is going to be how far into the screen the robot manages to move in a thousand time steps. So that's the positive Z direction. So the fitness function is basically just capturing the final Z coordinate of the robot's main body at the thousandth time step and returning that as the, the fitness. Make sense? Pretty straightforward? Okay, so that's assignment 10. Uh, if there's any questions about this, we can talk about it at the beginning of class on Thursday. This will be due next Monday night and then on class class next week on Tuesday, we will talk about the final project. So if you go back to, if we go back to the top of the uh, wiki page for assignment 10, you can see next steps. These are all the final projects that students tackled last year. So if you manage to finish assignment 10 early, browse through some of these projects and it gives you a feel for the sorts of things that are, that are possible now that you have a fully uh, integrated robot simulator and robot evolver. Any questions about assignment 9, assignment 10?
We're all good? Okay. So let's jump back to the schedule. And again, just to remind ourselves, we're working through some of the major challenges in the field of evolutionary robotics. It's a new field. There's a lot of unanswered questions out there. We've been tackling in lectures 13, 14, and also in lectures 15 today, issues about the genotype to phenotype mapping. So how do we take a blueprint or a recipe, the genotype, the thing that's actually being mutated and crossed and evolved, and translate that into a phenotype, which in our case is usually a neural network and or a robot. So last time in lecture 14, we saw different ways of doing that. Um, what you're doing in assignment 10 is using a direct mapping where every number in the genotype corresponds to one and only one number or one trait, if you like, in the phenotype. Last time we saw an indirect mapping, which I'll bring you back to in a moment, where any one number in the genotype might code for, for zero, one, or more traits in the phenotype. And the mapping that we looked at uh, in lecture 14 and the neat and hyper-neat mappings that we're going to look at today are indirect mappings which are much more complicated. So the immediate question is, why would you want to create a more complicated mapping? And the answer is, is that you want to try and create a mapping that is more, more evolvable, which means it's easier for evolution to continuously increase the fitness of the phenotypes over time. And we'll see some of that today. Uh, we may finish lecture 15 today if we do. On Thursday, we'll tackle another open challenge in the field, which is crossing the reality gap. Most of what we've seen in this class is evolving robots and simulation. If we then hook up our simulator to a 3D printer and try and 3D uh, and try and manufacture or print a physical version of that simulated robot, usually the physical robot does not do what the simulated robot does in simulation because of course the simulation doesn't capture everything about reality that's important. So we're going to look at four different recent approaches to try and close the reality gap. Okay, so let's jump back to lecture 14 for a moment, and just to go very quickly through what we talked about last time, we're talking about the genotype to phenotype mapping. What is the genotype? What is the phenotype? The genotype is some kind of data structure which is the thing that is under evolutionary control. It's a collection of numbers that are being mutated and crossed and so on, and the phenotype is the thing that is awarded a fitness value. We take the genotype, we construct a phenotype somehow, we evaluate that phenotype, we get the fitness, that fitness is then assigned back to the genotype and decides whether the genotype survives into the next generation. Right? The genotype to phenotype map is the algorithm that translates that genotype, that phenotype, or that genotype into the phenotype. Direct mappings are pretty straightforward. Each element in the genotype corresponds to one number in the phenotype. In an indirect mapping, that's not normally the case. I showed you a little cartoon last time to try and motivate our thinking about why we might want to do that. And then last time we were talking about a particular genotype to phenotype mapping uh, that I developed years ago, which is a developmental mapping. So a developmental mapping is a particular kind of indirect mapping where now, instead of a blueprint for a genotype, we have a recipe, right? The genotype in a developmental mapping is describing how a phenotype changes over time. Add a sensor, remove a sensor, add a neuron, add a body part, grow a leg, and so on. Okay, so I walked you through some of the details of how this developmental mapping worked last time, and I think we ended here which was showing you these two robots down here that were evolved to push a very large block. We saw the ancestor robot that used peristaltic motion to move forward and bump into the block and move it a very short distance. And then over a number of generations, this ancestor evolved into this descendant robot here, which obviously has a different body, but retained this peristaltic motion to push against the block. And I think we ended last time by actually opening up these two robots and looking to see what this developmental genotype to phenotype mapping actually created. And it created this interesting neural network 
where there, if, where the mapping placed one touch sensor in each part of the robot and then connected that touch sensor with a synapse to the motor behind it. So sensor to motor, sensor to motor, sensor to motor, and sensor to motor. And because this neural network exists inside this robot that is embodied, when the robot moves, there's a sensory repercussion. Because it's embodied and because it has a particular mass distribution here, it produces this wave, this peristaltic wave, without any internal central clock or central pattern generator that produces a regular pattern over time. Right? The reason I wanted to show you this example was to provide another example for this idea of how evolution can exploit the embodied nature of an organism, or in this case, a robot, and often comes up with a non-intuitive solution, which is pretty simple. Right? This is quite different from what a human engineer might, might design. Okay, so that's the developmental mapping that we talked about before. Now, why would you go to the effort of creating such a complicated mapping where things are growing over time? The next two slides are going to try and show you why we went to the effort of creating this indirect mapping. What you're looking at in this picture here is a visualization of just one evolved genotype. And remember that these genotypes in this developmental mapping are genetic regulatory networks. We have a long string of numbers. So here's this one genotype down here. This is one long vector of numbers. And embedded in this long string of numbers are some genes that evolved. In this case, there were 65 genes that were created over evolutionary time. I've taken those 65 genes out of this string of numbers and tried to organize them in a particular way to try and show you what evolution came up with in this case. This evolved genotype here is the one that's found in both of these robots. There's relatively little difference between these uh, between the genotypes for these two robots. Both of them have basically this genotype. Now, what are we looking at here? Well, along the diagonal here, I put all the regulatory genes. Remember that regulatory genes are genes that when they turn on, they produce a chemical that diffuses through the body of the robot, and that chemical can then influence other genes. That's why it's called a network. Not unlike an artificial neural network, where you have one neuron that connects to another neuron with a synapse. In our DNA, there's a very similar process, but instead of being done electrically, it's done with proteins. One gene, when it's turned on, produces a protein that diffuses through the cell and into neighboring cells. And that protein can attach to other genes and turn them on, enhance them, or turn them off and try and repress them. So all of, the, all of the genes that produce proteins that regulate other genes, I placed along the diagonal here. And as you can probably imagine, all of the arrows here represent that this particular gene produces a chemical that influences this gene here. And this gene over here produces a chemical that influences this gene, this gene, this gene, and so on, and also this collection of genes over here. The genes that are placed on the right-hand side, these are all the structural genes, and they're called structural genes because when these genes are turned on, they produce a chemical that doesn't regulate other genes. It influences the growing structure of the robot. So these structural genes over here, when they turn on, they cause the robot to grow in some way. They might affect the body of the robot, or they may affect the growing neural network of the robot. And I've colored the ones that affect the body red and those that affect the brain blue. So here's a little bit of terminology for you. So structural genes affecting morphogenesis, morphogenesis, shape, or the, the genesis of shape. So morphogenesis is the growth of the body. Neurogenesis, as you can imagine, is are genes that affect the growth of the brain. Okay, so there's a pretty complicated picture here. Do you see any patterns in this picture? 
So we've got all the regulatory genes here. These regulatory genes are producing proteins that affect one another. This set of five genes here produces the same protein, and that protein affects this group of structural genes here. There is another single regulatory gene up here. It produces a chemical that influences this set of structural genes here. Is there any pattern here that you can see? You'll notice that there are different groups of these structural genes down here, but these two largest groups down here, this group, all of them except one influence the brain, and up here, all of them except these three affect the body. So we weren't sure if that just happened by chance or if that meant anything, but you can actually see that's, that it looks like evolution has separated out regulation of those genes that affect neurogenesis or growth of the brain and those genes that affect morphogenesis or the growth of the body. We looked into this in a little more detail and it turns out that if you mutate any one of these five genes here, these regulatory genes, this is why I've colored them black here, if you fiddle with these, they disrupt the expression of these genes over here. And if they disrupt that group of blue genes over here and you regrow the robot, you get more or less the same body, but this neural pattern inside is absent or disrupted in some way. If instead you mutate this gene up here, it disrupts the expression of those morphogenesis genes up there. And if you do that and regrow the robot with that corrupted set of genes, what do you think happens? It tries to move the same way, but its body grows. Absolutely. It tries to move in the same way, but its body grows in a different way. So if we disrupt this gene, it disrupts neurogenesis. The body grows in the correct way, but the brain is disrupted. If we mutate this and regrow the robot, that neural patterning of one touch sensor attached to one motor neuron is still there, but the body grows very differently. Remember that I told you in these two, in these two robots here, they have very different bodies, as you can see. But in here, you get exactly the same neural structure. So it seems that this was a good solution for Mother Nature in this case. Mother Nature has dissociated or separated morphogenesis from neurogenesis. That sounds like a familiar trick that we've spent a fair bit of time talking about in this course. What is that dynamic? Modularity, right? So again, evolution left to its own devices, at least in this evolutionary run, has separated how the robot's body grows from how its brain grows, which allows evolution over time to fiddle with the body, but retaining this nice peristaltic motion that's produced by this brain structure, or vice versa. Okay, so that's one advantage of using this developmental mapping, is that it'll, it gives evolution more freedom to figure out how to grow the body and brain. And in this case, evolution has decided to grow body and brain separately. That's one advantage. Here's the second one. Again, I'm showing you now a fitness curve like we've seen before, which is represented by the thin black line here. So in the first 20 generations, the robots that grew never pushed the large block at all. They moved around at random or they didn't move at all. After 20 generations, this robot appeared in the population, and as I showed you in the video last time, it moves forward and happens to just bump into the block, and it moves the block about five centimeters. This robot is the best robot in the population for about the next 80 generations. Nobody else evolves that's any better than this robot. That's the fitness of this robot. The thick black line over here, this thick black line corresponds 
to the vertical axis on the right-hand side here. So for each version of this robot, and there was more than one in the population, we recorded the number of genes that existed in the genotype. So in this example here, I showed you there were 65. But most of the time, there are only about 20, 20 genes in the genotype that produces this robot. How can there be more or less genes in the genome that produces the same phenotype? What happens if you have a gene in this genotype here, a gene that produces a chemical like this one here, this guy here, this gene, when it's turned on, it produces a chemical, but that chemical isn't listened for by any other gene. So it's kind of shouting into the, the darkness, right? It doesn't, no one's listening. So what happens if this gene gets mutated or deleted? Nothing, right? It has no impact on the, the phenotype. <clears throat> Here's another one over here. Here's a gene that influences these two genes here. Maybe this one here for neurogenesis creates a neuron, but that neuron has no synapses connecting to it, and it has no synapses leaving from it. So what happens if this gene gets mutated or deleted or copied? Again, that doesn't affect the movement of the robot. If you have a neuron and it doesn't connect to any sensors or connect to any motors, that neuron is having no influence on the robot's behavior. So there's a lot of neural structure embedded in here which doesn't really affect the robot at all. Right? It's this idea of junk DNA. So you can have different phenotypes that have more or less genes that produce exactly the same phenotype, which is this one here. And that's why you see fitness here stays constant, because there's lots of versions of this robot in the population that all push the block about five centimeters. And some of them have more or less than about 20 genes. OK. That went on for about 80 generations. We were kind of about to turn off the simulation. We figured everything was done. But as you can see here, at generation 100, there was now a set of mutations that started to produce different robots. And they had intermediate form between this one and this one, and after about 20 generations, they had evolved into this robot, which now dominated the population for the rest of the evolutionary run. This robot, because of its larger mass and its larger force, was able to push the block slightly less than 40 centimeters. If you now look at this evolutionary transition here between this robot and this robot, there was actually a drop in the number of genes and then at this period here, when this robot first appeared in the population, it also had about 20 genes. So we had an increase in the complexity of the phenotype, the robots made up of many more parts, but no real increase in the complexity of the genotype. We still had about the same number of genes. We're not sure what happened at this point. There seemed to be some drift towards more and more genes here. You can see one here that has 65 genes. That's the one that I showed you on the previous slide. So in this genotype to phenotype mapping, in order for the robot to become more complex, Mother Nature does not have to add more and more genes. So if evolution isn't adding more and more genes, what is the difference between these two genotypes that produces this different phenotype. Any ideas? The way, they regulate each other. the way they regulate each other. So what Mother Nature seems to be doing in this evolutionary run, instead of adding a lot more genes, which she does later in the run, but that's actually not very useful, is changing the wiring of the genes, how the existing genes regulate one another. What's becoming more clear in biology over the last few years is that that's also what happens in the history of life. Um, we may or may not be at the top of the food chain, but we are definitely not uh, the uh, we are definitely not the organism with the most number of genes. Humans have 
somewhere around 20,000 genes. It's kind of hard to count, but somewhere around there. There are much simpler organisms that have orders of magnitude more genes than we do. If you compare us to our closest uh, living relatives, the differences between our genetic regulatory networks and those of other species is not so much the presence or absence of genes, but the wiring between the genes. Mother Nature seems to come up with a certain set of genes that work well, and then most evolutionary progress is made by changing how genes regulate one another. Okay, interesting for us, but as roboticists, what we're really interested in is, again, this open issue of scalability. We want to try and evolve robots that become increasingly complex. Instead of having four touch sensors and eight motors, we would like to scale up to evolve robots that have hundreds and thousands of sensors and motors and neurons and so on. But we don't want to have to scale up our genotype as the phenotype becomes more complex. So by using this kind of genotype to phenotype mapping, evolution can create phenotypic complexity without having to grow genotypic complexity. Okay, that was the main reason why we built this genotype to phenotype mapping. Okay, so just to step back now from this experiment, what are we looking for when we try and create an algorithm that will translate a genotype into a phenotype? Well, we want that mapping or that encoding to have these following three properties. We want it to be compact in the way that I just showed you. We want to be able to evolve robots that have tens, hundreds, and then thousands of sensors and motors, but we don't want to then have tens and hundreds and thousands of genes or evolutionary parameters. We want it to be compact somehow. We also want our genotype to be expressive, meaning that the genotype is not just specifying the brain of the robot, but also its body. Right? We're trying to put as much of the robot under evolutionary control. Because as engineers or roboticists, we want to try and take a step back and not build our biases and assumptions into the robot. Right? Thinking about thinking is misleading. We want to be able to automatically design robots that exhibit increasingly sophisticated and ultimately cognitive behavior. Here's one that we are going to talk about in a moment in lecture 15. We also want our mappings to be evolvable. So what do we mean by evolvable? Well, that means that sometimes when we evolve a population, it's hard for evolution to make progress. Almost all of the mutations produce children that have lower fitness than their parents. In an evolvable, in an evolvable system, evolution can just continue indefinitely. So no matter how high the fitness raises in the population, there are always going to be mutations that produce yet more fit uh, children. Okay. So here's the open problem then. We don't know how to do this. I've shown you some mappings, and we're going to see a couple more in lecture 15, that try and do this, but there's no systematic way that we know of yet to sit down and design a mapping that maximizes all three of these properties. Okay. One of the challenges for that is that there's the issue of pleiotropy. Here's a little bit more terminology for us. So pleiotropy is the idea that one gene can affect several phenotypic traits that usually reduces evolvability. Why would a genotype to phenotype mapping where you have one gene that's affecting many traits, why would that tend to make a population less evolvable? What principle is pleiotropy going against? Exactly. So a mutation to a gene that's affecting lots of traits is going to disrupt all of those traits. What is that property or lack of that property? Modularity, right? Exactly. Okay. So here's a little cartoon to try and show you a modular genotype to phenotype mapping and an equivalent non-modular genotype to phenotype mapping. So Imagine we have a genotype and it has six genes here. These six genes are affecting four phenotypic characters. So these are different parts of the phenotype. You could imagine these are the tau's or the time constants of the neural network. 
or the synaptic weights. These different characters come together and affect phenotypic complexes. So we have C1 and C2. Imagine that these different complexes are locomotion and manipulation. I won't play this video for you, but you'll probably remember this from the beginning of the course. We had the quadruped that was evolving the ability to manipulate the blue object in front of it. So imagine one, one of these complexes is the body and brain that allows to grasp and lift up the object. And the other phenotypic complex is the complex that controls the movement of the legs for locomotion. These two different complexes give us two components of our fitness function, how well the robot locomotes, F1, and how, the, how well the robot grasps and manipulates the object, F2. Okay, so genotype on the left, phenotype on the right, genotype on the left, phenotype on the right. Here's our modular mapping. We have any one gene that is really only affecting this module. But down here, we have some of these genes that are affecting parts of the phenotype that fall into both modules here. So there's not, there aren't really separate modules in this situation over here. And as was mentioned, any one mutation to any of these genes is probably going to disrupt not just locomotion, but ob also object manipulation and vice versa. In this modular mapping over here, evolution might mutate this gene and tinker a little bit with locomotion. Maybe the robot goes a little bit faster, a little bit slower, but it does not disrupt the robot's ability to grasp the object. Okay. So too much pleiotropy, and we start to lose modularity. Okay, so since this is an open question, there's lots of hypotheses we could propose and try and tackle. You might want to try and break off a smaller part of one of these questions for a final project. What kinds of evolutionary pressures will cause a genotype to phenotype mapping to become more or less modular? We've spent a couple of lectures talking about this, right? We would like evolution to find this kind of mapping but we probably don't know before we start what these separate modules should be, right? Thinking about thinking is misleading. We'd like to figure out ways to allow evolution to produce modularity like it happened to do in this case. Why it worked in this case, we're not so sure. Okay. How do we create these maps that are compact and expressive and evolvable? Tricky. We don't really know how to do that. Even if we did manage to do it for one fitness function or in one task environment, the same encoding may not be so compact and expressive and evolvable when we take the same mapping and try and evolve the robot to do something else. Okay, these are open questions. We don't have a good answer to them. If you want to try and tackle one part of these in a final project, could be could be fun. Okay, so that's, uh, that's indirect mappings. Let's switch now to uh, another pair of algorithms called MEET and HyperMeet. So these are separate genotype to phenotype mappings. And these mappings were designed to maximize evolvability. Right? So these mappings we're going to see in a moment make it easier when you start to evolve uh, using this genotype to phenotype mapping. You produce higher and higher fitness over time. You don't get stuck in local optima. We'll see that towards the end of this, this lecture. OK, in this lecture, we're going to I'm going to start by describing the NEAT algorithm for you. Then we're going to talk about the hyper-NEAT algorithm, which, as you can probably guess from the name, is an extension of NEAT. And at the end of this lecture, we're going to put NEAT and hyper-NEAT together. And when we do, you're going to see that this produces a very evolvable mapping, which is great for evolutionary robotics. OK. So uh, the reading for today, the optional reading is the NEAT algorithm. We're only going to spend a couple slides on the NEAT algorithm. The required reading for today is another research paper about hyper-NEAT. OK, so we're going to do this historically. Where did the idea for NEAT come from? The original idea for NEAT came from the following problem, which is known as the competing conventions problem. 
which has to do with the fact that if you have two neural networks in your population and you mutate them, usually you're okay, right? In your final in assignment 10, you're going to be evolving neural networks, but you're only mutating them. You're not crossing them. And the reason why is because it's actually very difficult to take two neural networks, cut them in half, combine the two halves from the two parents together, and get a new neural network that does better than either parent. So crossover typically does not work very well for neural networks because of the competing conventions problem. And this cartoon example here is to illustrate this problem. Let's imagine that we have neural networks that have two inputs and one output. Let's imagine we have these two neural networks in the population. They've been evolving for a while. And unbeknownst to us, it turns out that in order to get high fitness for whatever we're evolving these neural networks to do, they need to compute three subfunctions, A, B, and C. Both of these neural networks have, let's imagine that they've evolved to the point where they basically got A, B, and C worked out. Maybe they're not perfect. There could be slight improvements to A, B, and C, but they're doing pretty well. However, you'll notice that in this neural network here, the first hidden node has evolved to compute subfunction A. But in this neural network over here, it's the third hidden neuron that's evolved to compute subfunction A, and vice versa, right? So over here, B is in the same place. The second hidden neuron has evolved for B, but in this case, it's the third hidden neuron and the first hidden neuron that's computing C. And let's imagine they combine these subfunctions together pretty well to produce the overall output that we want. Okay. Let's assume now that these two neural networks were selected in the population, and we're going to try and cross them. So that's what, it, that's what this is showing down here. We take neural network A, B, and C, and we cross it with network C, D, and A over here. Let's imagine that we decide to cut the neural network here between the first and second hidden neuron. So we're going to take this piece from parent one, and this piece from parent two and combine them into a child network. But if we do, that gives us a neural network that computes A, B, and A, which is this one over here. We take this piece from parent one and this piece from parent two, put them together, and we now get a child that computes C, B, C. What's the problem? The two child neural networks down here are going to do worse than the two parents. Why? If you don't get the full range of the, of the uh, actions. Exactly. Of the, the, the three subfunctions that they need to compute, right? No matter how we cut these two neural networks, they never end up with one copy of subfunction A, B, and C. So, for example, perhaps this neural network does well in two-thirds of the fitness trials that we try it out in. This one also does well in two-thirds, but not in the other third because it's missing that, that third piece. Okay, so maybe we just chose to cut this network at the wrong place. So let's cut the networks between the second and third hidden neuron. What happens in that case? Same thing, right? So if we cut between the second and third hidden neuron, child one ends up with A, B, and A. And the second child ends up with C, D, and C again, right? It's very hard. I think it's impossible in this cartoon to actually find a way to cut these networks in two pieces and put them together in a way which they combine all of the parts. What would be really nice if we could somehow see that this, the first hidden neuron here, is computing more or less the same function as the third hidden neuron in the second parent and line these up. Also, to detect that these two hidden neurons compute more or less the same problem, line them up, then see that these two compute more or less the same function, and line them up. So if we could somehow rearrange these, 
I'll put A prime, B prime, and C prime for parent one, and A, B, and C for parent two. Now we could start to cross these in a nice way, right? So no matter where we cut now, in this case, we might copy across A prime, then switch to parent two, and get B and get C, and the second child would get A from this parent, B prime from this parent, and C prime from this parent. And the two children now get one copy of all of the subfunctions that they need to compute, but they get different versions of that function from different parents. Is this starting to sound familiar from high school biology? We've got different alleles, A prime and A, and they're different versions of the same gene. Right? It's important that each child gets all the necessary pieces in order to survive, but which copy of which piece they get from either parent, it should be shuffled a little bit. So hopefully, in some of the children, you bring together the best of both worlds. Right? In this case here, maybe parent one is doing a slightly better job of computing A than parent B is, uh, than parent two is, and vice versa. Maybe this parent is not doing as well at computing B, and this parent is doing better at computing B. It would be nice if a crossover event brought together the better versions of this subfunction from both parents. But how do we do that? How do we rearrange these pieces? How do we know that this, how do we know that this neuron is computing more or less the same function as this neuron? The idea for the NEAT algorithm came from the fact that one way to tell similarity of function in different parts of the neural network is to trace back to a common ancestor. So let's imagine for a moment that both of these neural networks evolved from the same parent neural network earlier in evolution. And that earlier parent was computing some version of A that ended up at this point in this child and ended up over here in this child. Imagine there was some sort of marking on these neurons that said we both came from the same neuron in a parent or an ancestor. So what we're going to see in the NEAT algorithm in a moment that there actually are these historical markers so we can look at any neuron in any pair of neural networks and ask the question, did those neurons evolve from the same neuron in the parent? If they did, then we can line things up by historical marker and increase the chances that we get one copy of all of the things that we need. That's the intuition. Okay, let's have a look at how this actually works. Here's the neat genotype. So in the neat genotype, there are two, uh, there are two lists here. The first list lists all of the nodes that make up the neural network. So in this neural network here, we have three sensor neurons, one hidden neuron, and one output neuron. So the first list dictates the neurons. The second list, which they call connections, which for us are synapses, they have a list of synapses. And each element in the list, each element in the list corresponds to one synapse. And that element has all the information we need to determine that synapse. So this synapse says, I go from neuron one to neuron four. I have a weight of 0.7 and I'm enabled, and I also have an innovation number, which is this historical marking. We'll come back to it in a moment. The next element in the list indicates this synapse. This element in the list connects neuron two to neuron five, but there's a binary, uh, there's, a, there's a bit in here which has been turned off. So some of the genes can be enabled or disabled. So here's another example of this sort of junk DNA. This synapse is not expressed at the moment. This one uh, dictates the structure, uh, the parameters that describe the synapse that connect neuron three to five, four to five, and five to four. 
you can see in this neural network we have a recurrent connection, and a recurrent connection tells us what about this neural network? It can remember in this case, right? Okay, so here's the genotype, and here's the phenotype. Okay, what is this innovation number? Well, this innovation number here is exactly what I just mentioned here. It's this historical marking. It's this historical marking that indicates whether a particular synapse in this case evolved from the same synapse in a common ancestor. So how does this work? Well, we keep a global counter uh, as we're evolving our neural networks. And every time a new neuron or synapse is adding, is added to a neural network, like we see here, assign the value of the global counter to that synapse or that neuron, and then increment the counter. So let's imagine we're going along and we create a genotype and we add a new neuron, and we give that neuron the current value of the global counter, and it happens to be five. This genotype survives in the population and produces two offspring. These two offspring have a copy of that synapse or that neuron, and so we see that innovation number appearing twice in each of the children down here. If we then add a neuron or a synapse, for example, to one of the children, we give the new value, we assign whatever the value of the global counter is. This child has a particular synapse that this one does not have. These two synapses here might start to mutate or change over evolutionary time, but we can assume that they contribute to more or less the same subfunction in the neural network because they evolved from the same place in the common ancestor. Make sense? Okay. Okay, so let's have a look at how this works. Here's an example genotype here. Here's the phenotype that it specifies. Mutation is pretty straightforward. In this case, a mutation adds a synapse over here that connects neuron 3 to neuron 4. The current value of this global counter is 7. So we assign a historical marker of 7 over here. We can mutate or add not just a connection or a synapse, but we can also add a, a, a node or a neuron. In this case, they've added a new neuron. I'm only showing you the sy synapse list here, not the node list. In this case, a node was added. And when that node was added, we broke the synapse that connects 3 to 5. So we can see 3 to 5 is active here, we turn synapse 3 to 5 off here, and we add two synapses, one that connects neuron 3 to neuron 6, and another synapse that connects neuron 6 to neuron 5 over here. So this is just mutation, pretty straightforward. We're adding things. We could also select an existing neuron, an existing synapse, go in and change the weight slightly. So we can add, delete, and modify synapses or nodes. Here's why NEAT was designed, however, which is allow, is allows us to cross over two different neural networks. So let's take two parent neural networks, one and two. Here's the genotype for each of these parents. Here's the phenotype. And you can just look at these two neural networks and see that they have slightly different structure. Right? So how the heck do you go about cutting these two neural networks in half and combining them in a way in which the two child neural networks get more or less the same functions from both. Here's how we do it. We take uh, all of the uh, we take all of the synapses from parent one. We line them up from left to right. Then we take all of the we take all of the synapses from parent two. We also line them up from left to right, but we line up synapses that have the same historical <coughs> marker. So these two synapses that connect neuron 1 to 4, in, uh, in, in this case here we have neuron, uh, sorry, this synapse here which connects neuron 1 to neuron 4. The same synapse in parent 2 is currently disabled. There is no synapse that connects neuron 1 to neuron 4, but we line these up. We line up these, 
you can see that there are some disjoint members here. So these are synapses which appear in one parent but don't appear in the other. And there might also be some excess genes over here, genes that are just extra. Okay. So NEAT is designed to allow us to cross over these neural networks in a way that's algorithmically simple. Just line up all of the synapses so that all of the historical markers line up as best as you can. And then we just cut things as we normally would. We go from left to right. And as we do, as we do, wherever there is, uh, wherever there's a match, so we have one synapse in both parents that has the same historical marker, we flip a coin, heads we take the synapse from parent one, tails we take the synapse from parent two. We now come to synapse number two, pick one of these at random, come to the disjoint gene, and now we either add this gene or we don't because it's missing in the parent. Keep going. And same thing with the excess genes. In this case, we happen to copy both into the, the parents, uh, into the child. In this case, I'm just showing you one of the two offspring neural networks. You look at the structure of this child. It looks structurally similar to both parents. That's just the structure. It doesn't tell us much about the function, but generally speaking, that's a good hint that we managed to capture some of the function from both parents. Make sense? Okay, so that's the neat algorithm. I didn't want to spend too much time on it, but I wanted to just introduce it as a, it's a very common method that's used in our field. It turns out that by doing this, you tend to avoid the competing conventions problem, and evolution is more evolvable in this case, because evolution can not just mutate neural networks, but also cross or combine genetic material from two different neural networks. And that crossover event from time to time produces an offspring that is better than either parent because it inherited the best parts of both parents. If you don't use NEAT and you just randomly cut two neural networks in half and glue them together, 99.9999% of the time, those children are terrible. They, you, you cut your Mac in half, you cut your friends, uh, PC in half and glue them together, you're not going to get a functioning computer, right? Okay. So that's the NEAT algorithm. Let's put the NEAT algorithm to the side for the moment. We're going to now talk about the hyper-NEAT algorithm, and then we're, we'll combine these two pieces together. Okay. Hyper-NEAT is... A, oh, so I'm sorry. I forgot to mention one aspect about NEAT. We just finished our discussion about genotype to phenotype mappings. Is this a direct mapping? Is this an indirect mapping? Is this a developmental mapping? Let's start with just deciding if this is a direct or indirect mapping. How can we know which of these two it is? So in a direct mapping, any one number in the genotype corresponds to only one part of the phenotype, one in exactly one. Is that the case here? No? Why not? Uh, well, some of the genes are used only in the genes, and uh, like the toxic genes, and then the, more of the outside effects are Ah, I see, right. So if you mutate, for example, uh, Synapses, for example, synapse four to five here, this is combining material, combining functions from the sensor layer. That's, yeah. that's true. So if you mutate this synapse, it has more of an effect, perhaps, than mutating some of the upstream synapses. That's true. But that's, now we're talking about fitness or behavior. So for the moment, we're just talking about values in the genome affecting numbers in the phenotype. So remember in your project, you have 32 numbers in your weight matrix, which is your genotype, and each one of those 32 numbers points to exactly one number in the neural network, which is the phenotype. So you, have a, you have a direct mapping. One number influences just one part of the phenotype. Is that true here? <coughs> 
So each one of these lists of synapses, right, they indicate, uh, they indicate which neuron the synapse starts at and which neuron the synapse ends at. And it's not shown in this list here, but there's also a single number, which is the, the weight of this synapse, the weight of this synapse, and so on. What about the weight of this disabled synapse here? Does it show up in the phenotype? No, right? When, it, when it, a synapse is disabled, it doesn't show up in the phenotype. So this synapse, which connects neuron 2 to neuron 5, is currently disabled. So whatever the weight of this disabled network, uh, of this disabled synapse is, it doesn't show up in the phenotype. So any one number in this genotype can correspond to one or zero parts of the phenotype, which makes it an indirect mapping. It's mostly direct that any one number here more or less corresponds to one number in the phenotype, but not perfectly, right? So it's mostly a direct mapping much more direct than the one I showed you in the previous lecture. Okay, so NEAT is more or less a direct mapping. I'm going to show you HyperNEAT, which is definitely an indirect mapping, and let's see why. What does HyperNEAT do? Well, like NEAT, it's also going to evolve neural networks, but these are a special kind of neural networks, which are called compositional pattern-producing networks, or CPPNs, bit of a mouthful. But we'll have a look at what these CPPNs do. HyperNeat, as the name implies, uses NEAT to evolve these neural networks. So when we just described NEAT, we talked about mutating and crossing neural networks, but we didn't talk about what these neural networks actually do. In HyperNeat, we're going to use NEAT to evolve neural networks that have a, a specific property. And what is this property? Well, CPPNs take as input not sensor values or training data like in machine learning. They take as input spatial coordinates, x and y, and they produce as output a value that is painted, quote unquote, onto that position. And we're going to see a number of examples uh, to, to see how this works. So here's a CPPN over here. Here's the genotype. This genotype takes as input the x and y coordinates of every pixel in this image over here. So in this case, we have a genotype. And this genotype is producing a phenotype, which in this case is a picture. And how does it do it? Well, it takes as input x and y and produces a value. And that value is going to color that pixel. You'll also notice that in CPPNs, inside each of the neurons here that make up the neural network, there's a little graph. What do you think that graph represents? Think about how neurons work. So, so far, these neurons should look familiar to you. They take an incoming influence, multiply it by the synaptic weight. They take the value of another. Uh, incoming value, multiply it by synaptic weight, and they sum it. You have the raw sum. And what happens to the raw sum that's coming into that neuron? What have we been doing so far with most of the neural networks we've seen after we compute that raw sum that's arriving at the neuron? We squash it between two values, right? We add, we put it through an activation function, which will squash it to some desired range. In a CPPN, we don't have to squash the value. We can pass it through any arbitrary function. So what these little uh, embedded graphs are showing is on the x-axis. The x-axis represents the raw incoming sum. And the vertical axis shows the actual value that we output to the next neuron. OK, so let's actually make some of these CPPNs to build up an intuition for how they work. So on the left side of the board here, I'm going to draw a CPPN. And on the right side of the board, I'm going to draw the phenotype produced by that CPPN. Let's start with a very simple one. This one has just one neuron. 
We have our vertical axis, our horizontal axis here, which is the raw sum, and our vertical axis here, which is going to be the transformed, the squashed or the transformed function. So let's put x and y here. And let's start with the identity function. So whatever the raw sum is that arrives at this neuron, we output, we don't squash it at all. We just apply the identity function and pass that as output. Okay, I mentioned that CPPNs always take spatial coordinates. So let's pass in for the moment just x. The x coordinate of every pixel in this image. So in this image, we have on the x-axis here, let's say this goes between 0 and 1, and the y-axis here also goes between 0 and 1. So let's take, let's start by visiting this pixel. This pixel has an x-coordinate of 0. We take 0, we pass it into this function x is 0 here, the output is also 0, so we output a 0. And let's paint the pixels here, not by color, but just by grayscale. So the closer the output is to 0, the darker that pixel is. The closer the outcoming value is to 1, the brighter that pixel is. So what is the grayscale or darkness of the pixel at x equals 0, y equals 0? It's black, right? So I'll just write zero in here for the moment, right? Now let's visit the next pixel, which has an x-coordinate of 0.1, let's say. We pass 0.1 in here. What arrives out here? 0.1. So actually, let's start to draw or paint these pixels. So it's a little bit lighter than this one. What happens as we visit each of the pixels out here, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, 0 0.4, and so on, all the way out to x equals 1? It's going to go from black all the way towards white, right? We're going to get a little bit of a gradient along here, black to white. Now, we've got a, now we have to visit y equals 0 0.1 and x equals 0. What's the value of this pixel? According to our CPPN, we take the coordinate of this pixel, pass it in here. What do we get? It's black, right? So we're, we're, we visited this pixel. It also has an x value, x equals 0. We pass x equals 0 in here. 0 comes out. We get black. What happens to this row in this image? Same thing, right? We go from black to white, and this whole image will gradually go from black to more and more white as we travel from left to right. So in a CPPN, we visit each pixel in this two-dimensional image, and we're painting values onto this, onto each pixel. So far, so good? Okay, let's play this game again. So let's reset our phenotype. Let's mutate this CPPN a little bit. The only thing we're going to change now is we're going to pass in the Y coordinate rather than the X coordinate. So we've changed the genotype slightly over here. We've changed our CPPN. How does the phenotype change? What, what picture do we get as an output from the CPPN? Exactly right. Instead of a horizontal gradient from black to white, we get a vertical axis going from black to white as we go up here. OK. So we're using CPPNs to paint pictures. Why are we bothering to do this? This seems kind of strange. Let's continue on for a little bit. Let's mutate our CPPN again. Now let's assume that we're feeding in x times this synaptic weight, so let's just set to 1 for the moment, plus y times this synaptic weight. What picture do we get now? 
right here. So we get a diagonal gradient here, right? If we pass in x equals 0 and y equals 0, we get 0 at the output. And out here, maybe we get 2, so we might have to squash it a little bit. But we make another change, and now we get a different gradient. Let's make another change here. Let's go back to x for a moment, and instead of the identity function here, let's put in a sinusoidal pattern. So now we have a, we have a mutation which changes the activation function inside this neuron. What, is this, what pattern is this CPPN going to produce? Something like that, right? So it's going to be it's going to be a gradient that oscillates as we go from left to right, right? So we're going to get waves of white grading into black, and so on. Okay. So now, if you go back and look at this CPPN, you can see that there isn't just one neuron, but there's multiple neurons that are computing a function, passing it to another one, and these functions are different. So we're, this neural network is composing functions. It's computing one function on top of another. And if you do that, you get regular patterns in the image. This, uh, this, this algorithm was created by Ken Stanley, and I'm just going to show you uh, an image from a website he created. I tried this website this morning, and it didn't work. I don't know if it's my machine or the website. You can try this out on your own. It's working. This is a website called PicReader. And this is what PicReader looks like. It creates 15 random CPPNs, takes each one of those CPPNs, and uses it to paint uh, brightness onto the pixels in that image. These are the kinds of images you get when you start. You can then click on some of these images to keep them. The ones that you don't click on are deleted, and it'll show you a fresh set of patterns which are mutated and crossed versions of the CPPNs that produced these patterns. Let me see if I can bring up the website. Uh, no such luck. Well, that's a shame. Maybe it's okay. So you can go and watch this video if you like. I'll put it. I'll put it on the schedule for you. So you can keep going. You can sort of see that there are these regular patterns and gradients that are appearing. In the, in the population of CPPNs here. So the nice way to build up an intuition for CPPNs is thinking about how a CPPN paints regular patterns onto, in this case, two-dimensional images. So a little cartoon over here is to try and illustrate why you might want to use Hyperleaf. One of the things we probably want in our phenotype is not just modularity, but also regularity. So in this case, in this example here, there's a Gaussian function that's being applied on the x. So we get something on the left that's the same on the, the right. Maybe the sine function is applied to the y coordinate. And you can also, depending on what's going on inside the CPPN, also get it to paint very specific patterns in specific places. So by evolving CPPNs and giving them spatial input, we can paint different patterns across space. OK. So Hyperneat is called Hyperneat because it's painting regular patterns onto a hypercube, because we don't necessarily need to just use two dimensions. We could also paint regular patterns onto a three-dimensional cube. How would we alter our CPPN over here so that instead of painting patterns on a two-dimensional plane, it's now going to paint regular patterns onto a cube or into a cube? Exactly. We just add Z here. And now we visit every voxel, which is a three-dimensional pixel, inside this cube and pass in the three-dimensional dimen three coordinates of that pixel, and our CPPN will darken or lighten that pixel as it goes, and we'll get a regular pattern in three-dimensional space. 
We could go up into hypercubes, which we will do when we go when we switch to robots in a moment. So again, once we go past three dimensions, this gets hard to visualize. But imagine we wanted to paint regular patterns inside a four-dimensional hypercube. What would we do? How would we modify CPPNs to do that? Add a fourth input, right? W. Okay. So hard to visualize regular patterns in a four-dimensional hypercube. Imagine that we wanted to create, instead of images, we wanted to create colorized images like you see here. So in this case, in the CPPN here, we have one output, and that output dictates the brightness or darkness of that voxel. How would we modify CPPN so now, instead of painting darkness or brightness, they're going to paint color into each of the pixels or voxels. Now, now how do we need to modify the CPPN? So imagine that we want our CPPN now to paint the R, G, and B values, the red, green, and blue values, into each voxel. How do we need to change our CPPN now? Exactly. So instead of one, one output, now we have an output for R, another output for G, and another output for B. And now we can paint color inside an Im a two-dimensional image or three-dimensional or higher. Remember that we're evolving these neural networks using NEAT. So NEAT can add, remove, and delete can add, remove, and modify neurons as well as synapses. So there may be more or less functions inside here. Right? In the little cartoon over here, we only have one neuron. Okay. Imagine that you wanted to use HyperNeat now not to paint pretty pictures, but to create an animation. So we want to paint a picture that changes over time. We could again use HyperNeat to do it, to, to paint regular patterns across not just space, across x and y, but also across time. How would we do that? How do we need to modify the CPPN now? Add time as an input, right? So now we're going to visit, we're going to add as input x and y and t. So now we're going to visit every x and y, every, the, every pixel in every frame of the animation. We're going to paint the first image in our, uh, first image in our animation by setting t equal to 0 and visit each of the x and y coordinates. That'll paint our first picture. Then we advance the frame one step. And now we query the CPPN again for every pixel, but now with t equal to 1. And it's going to produce a different pic picture, t equals 2, and so on. And we will produce a regular pattern over time. So I'm giving you all these examples to try and help you build up an intuition for what HyperNeat was designed to do, which is to produce, to produce regular patterns across space and time. Speaking of time, we're just about out of it. So think about this one. How would you use HyperNeat to, instead of painting pictures, paint music? So for the musicians among you, imagine you have a blank sheet of, uh, of music, uh, a, a blank bar. How would you paint notes to, get, to produce a regular pattern over time? OK, I think we'll stop there. And we'll start next time by applying HyperNeat back to robotics. You have a quiz due tonight. Uh, get started on assignment 10. And I will see you on Thursday. Thank you.